Uh, I'd like to talk today about research methodology. Uh, and my example will be from translation history because a part of this project is concerning translation history in, in Latin America. My example though will come from Australia, which is where I am uh, at the moment. Now, uh, research, I, I remember the late and much regretted Gideon Turi commenting at one stage that he was not really interested in translation theory as, as getting right the way we do research on translation. And that if you set up the research methodology correctly, uh, the theoretical concepts will come in. They will come in when they're needed in, in order to work on your problems. And I very much uh, am in that line. Um, with respect to methodology, we have this sort of mythical simplification of translation studies. In the bad old days, it was all prescriptive, telling translators what to do. And then suddenly there was this epiphany and uh, we became descriptive and went out into the world and started to describe what translators do. And we found, we have found in the past 20, 30 years that uh, translation is far more varied, far more complex than any of the prescriptive simplifications that preceded us. However, uh, in that descriptive moment, very little attention has been paid to the, the problems that would inform neighboring disciplines. Uh, any discipline that works fundamentally on alterity, on, on the fact that we are working with other languages and other cultures, and that we as researchers have a position within that. If you go through the early work in descriptive translation studies, and in Gideon Turi, you'll find the, the presupposition that it is possible for the researcher not to be a player, indeed to be absent or neutral, and that your descriptions can be transparent to the thing described. Now, um, very few people in our neighboring disciplines would actually subscribe to that. And, and so that's what I want to deal with uh, today is the problematic nature of the researcher as a subject in the descriptive process. Um, I just want to, before I go on, this, this, working on research methodology is absolutely important, I think, to, to know or, or, or conceptualize this as something that applies to the researcher, but also to the translator. Uh, translators, when they are translating, they're engaging in the same kinds of problems of alterity as we are. And they are using concepts to solve problems. Uh, so I, I personally think that uh, a focus on research can, can resolve some of the age old problems we have around us, such as theory versus practice, academics versus professionals. What a lot of rubbish. It's research on both sides and research in the overlaps of most of, most of the scholars, 94% of translation scholars have translated regularly. Okay, that's research I did with Esther Torres. Do not believe in these big, big false oppositions. Now, uh, my interest in, in this has come from a situation now we're supervising uh, a doctoral candidate and my co-supervisor is an anthropologist, Adrian Hearn here at the University of Melbourne which is interesting, it's, it's interdisciplinarity. And the, uh, the students sort of complained at once to how oh, I came into this topic not knowing what I was looking for and, and I was wandering around and I've collected all this stuff and, and she's really worried about this, you know, the feeling of being lost. And uh, Adrian says, well, that's exactly how it should be. When I was trained as an anthropologist, this is what we learned to do, to forget yourself to be immersed in the object, to get rid of your presuppositions uh, and, and go into the object with an open mind. Ah, and, and, and this gave some comfort <laughs> to the student at, at that particular moment. And uh, 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 that, that, that intrigued me because my own thinking on methodology is precisely the opposite. And I'll be talking here about anthropology and our relations with anthropology. 
Um, personally, I do train students to get, I mean, mess around for one year, basically. Yeah, get lost for a year and see what's interesting and what you really want to do. But at the end of that year, hey, I want a research question. I want some falsifiable hypotheses, if possible. I want to know what methodology you're going to use. And I want a timetable, a schedule, which is precisely the opposite of this, this immersion in the other. Oh, why do I believe in those things? Well, uh, because we have to train people to produce a product. Uh, because one of the big problems I see is that our students, our research students, take on too much uh, work. They, 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 they initially have enough material for two, three, four doctoral theses. Uh, but also because there's a, 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 a deeply held um, suspicion of the possibility of neutrality, which this undoing of the self uh, seems to presuppose. Uh, I would make the same critique within translation theory of, for example, deverbalization, you know, as if it's possible to get rid of language and get to pure message. No, I don't think you can do that. Uh, it, it, or, or the neutrality of the researcher, which was presumed in, 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 in Turi, for example. I, I don't think you can do that either. Uh, and that is why I... Um, will um, put my bets or, or in, in my training or with, with researchers uh, not to go down that road. I mean, do it for a while because it's good to do it to figure out where you are and what you want to do. But I would oppose that supposed neutrality or undoing of the self, uh, which is also immersion in language education. Um, it's also the concept of uh, internationalization in localization, all these ideas that you can get rid of your own cultural baggage in, in order to do something entirely different. Firstly, I don't believe it's possible. I think you're kidding yourself when you do it. And secondly, it is wasteful, uh, which for a poor uh, Anglo-Saxon Protestant, you know, is were perhaps the greatest of sins, I must admit. Opposed to that, one can draw on the concepts of Gadamer's hermeneutics, for example, which recognizes that in order to construct knowledge in a process of engagement with the other, you need prejudice, vorwurf, uh, that, that you, 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 you've got to have this passion and involvement in the object in order to keep yourself motivated. But then with that uh, vorwurf, uh, prejudice, which is a positive thing in Gadamer, you have to reflect on it and you have to make yourself aware of what you are doing and look at yourself from the outside. Okay, and this is what I'm talking about when I refer to reflexive. I, I think research should be empirical. That just means engage with data and the engagement of data comes uh, as primacy over the construct of, of, of theory and then reflexive. It must help us to think about ourselves, okay? So there are those two parts, empiricism, and for me, that means falsifiable hypotheses, but I'm not working on that today, and self-reflection, which is what I am working on, okay? Now, my story comes from, uh, some of the first engagements with the Arenta, which is the Aboriginal uh, grouping in the very center of Australia. And uh, we moved to about 1896 when um, um, Baldwin Spencer, who was uh, a professor of biology at the University of Melbourne, who had been trained briefly for three months in anthropology in uh, in, in Oxford before coming out to Australia to be professor of biology. And he had been on several expeditions into the center of Australia, uh, describing uh, plants, animals, and Aborigines, almost all on the same level. He worked with a mediator called Francis Gillen, who did know some of the language Arenta, 
although in his notes we see him using Pigeon, pigeon English uh, in order to uh, gather knowledge from his informants. Now, uh, my entry into this is actually a book published uh, from 1907 in German, uh, in Frankfurt, and it runs to seven volumes uh, describing the, uh, the, the legends, the, the myths, the, folk, the and the fairy stories uh, of the Arenta, of these people. And that book was written by a missionary, a Lutheran missionary, a German called Karl Strelow. And in the first volume, Strelow says in a note at the bottom, when Spencer and Gillen say the word Alcheri means dream, the assertion is not correct. It's nicht zutreffend. To dream is Alcherama, derived from Algira, God, capital letter, and Rama, to see, thus, to see God. Ah, we have a translation problem, ladies and gentlemen. We have apparently the same word being translated in two different ways. Spencer and Gillen have translated this Algira as to dream, and Gillen has proposed to talk about dreaming or the dream time. And this translation, which comes from these first accounts, um, is very widespread. Uh, you can find countless books on Aboriginal beliefs. I'm not talking about Torres Strait Islanders, it's Aboriginal here, uh, referring to the dream time or the dreamy, the mythological time of the ancestors uh, prior to the, the current period. Uh, what in German in this book is translated as the Urzeit, the primal time, okay? And uh, many uh, Aborigines now talking about their beliefs will themselves in English use the term dreaming. I was seeing the other night, uh, knowledge of the land is knowledge of the dreamings in, in Aboriginal English. So, so this one anthropological account um, has had a, a very deep impact on the very words used uh, to, to describe uh, Aboriginal beliefs and, and the way Aborigines themselves talk about their beliefs in Australia. And the missionary is saying, no, no, you got it wrong. Uh, Algira doesn't refer back to the dreaming or anything. Algira is the word for God. Okay. Uh, we have a translation conflict. And that's the, that's the conflict that I want to go into now. Um, with my colleagues, Andrea Rizzi and Begat Lang here at the University of Melbourne, uh, we have been working on uh, trust-based translation history, a way of analyzing, oh, a, a short list of things to look for when you start doing translation history and, and the very great interest of the question, who trusted who? Uh, if we are working between cultures and languages, one has to trust a guide or informant or a mediator about the unknown. Why? Because we don't know the other languages. That's why we have uh, translators and mediators. So we ask very basic questions, who trusted whom? And I'll move now to the, the network of trust around Baldwin Spencer. Um, he, he has a building at this university named after himself, and he was actually head of the board of professors. He was the big man on campus. The, he was the campus back in the day, okay? Now, Spencer trusts his informant, Francis Gillen, who is of Irish descent, and he, he ran the telegraph, the telegraph station in Adelaide Springs. And he lived uh, there for a long time. And uh, uh, Gillen is trusted by the Arenta informants, or at least he trusts them. Spencer assumes that Gillen is completely trusted by the informants. And he assumes that Gillen knows the language. Now, when Spencer goes from Melbourne to Alice Springs, uh, he conducts his research as follows. Uh, Gillen gets the Aborigines to the Arenta in this case to perform their various ceremonies and 
Spencer and Gillen are allowed to observe. Why are they allowed to reserve, observe, sorry? Because Spencer says they are regarded as fully initiated. And I was allowed to attend because I pretended to be Gillen's brother, a family relation, and we could get in there, okay? So uh, this uh, initiated complete trust uh, a ceremony is performed only by the men because they were initiated as men. Uh, they assumed, if you like, that anthropological immersion. Now, who trusts what they write? In the first case, Sir James Fraser, author of The Golden Bough and the big man in the English-speaking world about the um, study of folklore. And, and, and mythology and the development of religion. Uh, Fraser was an evolutionist and uh, Spencer was trained in the evolutionist perspective, which means that, uh, for example, uh, higher religions, uh, monotheistic, come from more primitive religions, which are totemistic and that we can trace through that progression. So the discovery for Fraser of these very, very primitive people in the center of Australia was like a, a living museum, uh, a window on the primitive mind of, of the, the thoughts and beliefs and family structures that preceded the higher levels. And so Fraser uh, launched Spencer's and Gillen's books uh, in the English speaking world. He, he, he uh, corrected the proofs, he arranged the publication uh, he had every interest in this knowledge supporting his own reput reputation um, as what was anthropology in that day. To some extent, we find Andrew Lang, a Scottish uh, scholar of folklore, also uh, drawing on a Spencer's uh, work and being in communication with Spencer. But then we find that Gillen and Spencer's uh, translation of dreaming and their account of the Arenta is cited copiously, not just by Fraser, 1897, uh, Marcel Moss, 1900, Emil Durkheim, uh, 1912, uh, Malinowski, 1913, in his work on the, the family structure uh, of the Australian Aborigines, and of course, Sigmund Freud, Totem und Tabu, in 1913. So this account of the uh, the Arenta in the uh, Central Australia had an enormous influence on the very founders of not just anthropology, but sociology and psychoanalysis, of course. Okay, so, and they all trusted that account. And so that's the trust network around Spencer and the translation as dream time. Let me move now to the missionary, Carl Strelo. Who trusts him? Uh, he trusts his informants and he does speak their language. Um, it's remarkable, he, he, within three years he was preaching in Arenta and he had learned a, a different language before that and he had people from another Loricha uh, in the mission. So he was at least trilingual uh, in, uh, in the Aboriginal languages. His contact outside of Australia is a uh, Freiherr Baron von Leonhardi, who is an armchair anthropologist and is fascinated by Strelo's accounts of, of the, uh, the Arenta beliefs. And Leonardi, like Fraser uh, on the other side, arranges the publication of Strelo's uh, accounts and in fact, the accounts are based on a question and answer process. Uh, Leonardi would ask Strello, oh, you know, do, do they believe in reincarnation? What is the marriage ceremony like? How do family structures work? And those answers became the seven volume uh, account of the Aranda and Loricha people. Uh, Strello uh, is trusted by his family because he has uh, one of his sons, the last born son, became an anthropologist and his son uh, also works in the field. So he has had uh, a long line of, of family connections in Australia. And his work is very much admired, and it must be said, by Marcel Moss, 
um, who regards it as a great work of literature, a literary account of the beliefs. And he is cited by the same people uh, that Spencer cites to some extent, although Malinowski, uh, who cites Spencer a lot, uh, will put a question mark uh, when he cites Strelo. He, he's, a, he's more suspicious because uh, this is knowledge gathered through religion. Now, those two networks of trust cross paths. Uh, there's a letter um, uh, at the end of 1901, uh, Leonhardi writes to Strelo, so the guy in Frankfurt in, in Germany, writes to Strelo, the missionary, asking him about God and beliefs in God. Strelo replies, December the 20th, 1901, stating that the Arenta believe in a high God who is called Algira. And that's the word we just saw there with God in brackets. Leonardi sees this as, as evidence that there is primitive religion and that the religion can have almost monotheistic beliefs. This is dynamite because that's one of the big debates. He sends that to Lang, who was a Scottish folklorist, who sends it to Spencer, who is the guy who had given the opposite account. Spencer goes off his little nut. He, he, he thinks this is complete rubbish. And he cites that letter from Strelo in German, which is a reminder that German was a, a very strong language of science in that period. He cites it in a letter to uh, Sir James Fraser, who is his sponsor, saying, this is a load of rubbish. This is incorrect. This guy Strelo does not know what he's doing. And so we have two trust networks with a point of radical distrust. Okay. Now I want to analyze distrust. Sorry, I can go on for a long time with this story, but I'll, I'll try to go fast. Okay. We've got, I remind you, the anthropologist who here does not trust the missionary and the missionary does not trust the anthropologist. Why? Spencer says about Strello, not just in this one letter, but in a whole stream of letters, it goes for about 20 years. And you can tell he's been really hurt because somebody has questioned his methodology. Uh, he said, you know, we didn't understand the language. And the big difference is Strello knew the language and Spencer no idea of the language and had to trust his, his, uh, his mediators. Now, Spencer says, Strelo, the missionary, has not attended the ceremonies. Spencer has. If he hasn't attended the ceremonies, he has to rely on spoken accounts, and the Aborigines, when spoken to, will tell you anything in order for it to get a good meal. That is, uh, <laughs> the knowledge was not free, and they will tell you whatever you think. He says also, uh, because these ceremonies represent an anterior stage of knowledge, he's an evolutionist, they don't know the meaning of the chants anyway. So what they're telling you is only what uh, they are told to tell you, and there is this other knowledge that they have forgotten, and that the, the anthropologists can reconstruct. This is an evolutionary perspective. And then he tells you, you've only talked to men, and they will only tell you what the men tell the woman. So you're getting secondhand knowledge here. And then he says, they will tell you that Algeria is God because the missionaries who have that time been there for some 20 years have told them that the word Algeria means God prior to your arrival. And so to present this as evidence of their beliefs is only presenting evidence of the missionary incursion into their culture. Okay. And these are all really, really good arguments. And it's very hard for Strelo to get around that. However, uh, and, and for Lena Hardy sees all these arguments in these letters, and he, um, he writes to Strelo and says, look, tell us your methodology, because this guy's attacking you. What is your methodology? And Strelo doesn't. He's not really interested in the methodology. He's just giving the accounts. So von Leonardi, the 
uh, the German and, uh, armchair anthropologist in volume three of this seven volume account does give the methodology. And he uh, launches a critique of Spencer and Gillen. Uh, what does he say? Firstly, Gillen pretends to know Arenta but doesn't because we see he uses Pigeon English and Strello has observed him using Pigeon English. Two, the ceremonies are staged for you, Mr. Spencer, who comes from Melbourne. Why? Because you tell us they happen at night, but here are your photographs and they're all in the daytime. Three, the ceremonies have have to happen at certain sacred places, you tell us. But here we can see they all happen in Alice Springs, so you didn't have to travel to them. So what's happened is Gillen has paid the Arenta to give a little performance for the anthropologist coming up from Melbourne. Uh, three, in your photos, and, and the Spencer and Gillen, uh, um, it's really wonderful work. There are numerous photos and, and diagrams, and both, both works are really, really quite wonderful accounts. Um, you show the Aborigines naked in their primitive state, but the Aborigines around Alice Springs do wear clothes. So what you've done, you've made them take off their clothes in order to look more primitive in your accounts. Three or four, I don't know, four. Uh, the, um, your transcription of the Aranta sentences, uh, the transcriptions are badly passed and there are numerous language mistakes because you are not linguists. Uh, then he says, the initiated men do understand the chants and this is secret knowledge that can only be given under certain conditions. And then he says, Spencer and Gillen, if you think you have been initiated, you are wrong because initiation into the Arenta implies subcision of the penis. So I'm not going to show you photos of that. Go and look it up in Wikipedia. I assure you that the big professor from Melbourne had not undergone the initiation ceremony of the Arenta. Or if he did, he was a very brave man. Okay. Uh, I'd like to look at some of the photos now. Oh, you've got the photos up there. Oh, good. Okay. This is where we get into it. So you can see here some of the photos from Spencer and Gillen, 1896. Uh, oh, yes, we have uh, naked breasts, which, you know, sets all the anthropologists alight at the stage. And uh, it's true that uh, there's a lot of nakedness in it, or the men are tactfully covered in the vital parts. Let's move on to the next slide please and now this is the first page of spencer's of sorry Estrello's account and you can see on the right the first page and what he's got he's put a photo of his main informants what can we see they are four men they are clothed and they are respectably old uh, next slide please here they are uh, the kneeling posture is worrying. Uh, it looks, you know, if it were in the United States, you'd expect them to be wearing shackles, perhaps. It does imply uh, some kind of Christian reverence. Now, we do know who these people uh, were, and we do know approximately their dates of birth. So especially the man on the far left um, was a, a clever man, you know, a man of great knowledge, who had been born well before the Lutheran missionary came there. So he and the one next to them would be giving uh, accounts that were prior uh, to um, Christian indoctrination. And this is put at the beginning of the volume as a reply to the kinds of crit critiques coming from Spencer, saying, look, these are our informants. Um, they are old. And, and um, the other two did work on the mission, so their accounts might be more uh, suspect because there was monetary exchange. I could talk more about them, but I, I want to get on to other issues. So let's move forward. Now, this is the account that... Um, oh, I'll have to get it bigger so I can see it over here, right? This is the account that Strello gives <clears throat> of the, the god, Algira. And you can see he's up in the sky, big, strong man, um, hair falling over his shoulders. 
Uh, Emu feet, and in another place he says, uh, others say that Algira himself has uh, Emu feet and is in the sky, which is Alkira. Now, what's important here in this account is eternal, which is repeated twice, and the present tense. So in this book, uh, when Estrello describes the, uh, the, the beliefs, he says they are living beliefs in the present tense, and there is a, a, a con conception of the eternal, uh, the infinite, uh, which was one point of debate. And this is the big difference for me. I, in my published work on this, I go through the grammar of the German, and I argue that it's actually the use of the present tense is the big difference between the two. <clears throat> um, Spencer, the anthropologist, did everything he could to make this people look primitive. And he insists they are primitive. He insists that they are going to die out. Um, so when he goes back in, 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 uh, in the 1920s and he finds that the, his original informants have all died out, he's not surprised at all. It's sort of, I told you so. Uh, and um, whereas Trello is observing something that he believes is alive and well and vital and a part of the, of the, uh, the, the worldview. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Oh, sorry, I'll go, I'll go over here. Okay, now what's interesting is, um, and this is just well known for people who work with, uh, with First Nations knowledge in Australia. Uh, for us, when we look up at the heavens at night, we join up the dots and see animals and things in the shapes, right? Uh, the uh, indigenous view of the sky is of the dark spots which join up, okay? Seeing the same thing. So here's the Milky Way, and you can just see the emu that is up there, okay? And the emu feet, which are at, at the end of it. And uh, for the beliefs here, the stars are either the hair coming over or the many campfires uh, that Algira has as he moves around in the sky. Okay, so there's a different way of, of looking at the sky. Move on, please. Now, following that account of, of the way it's working, uh, Strello tries to analyze this linguistically because he's been trained as a linguist and uh, a German anthropology from von Humboldt from the beginning believe that language was the key to understanding the other culture. So he, he tries here in this account, the published one, 1907, he says, etymology, it works for European languages, which were being connected at that stage, it doesn't work, it won't work in, in Australia because of the huge time, um, time distances involved. He then does a confidential analysis and he finds in uh, Algeria, in this account, certain features that are shared with the Christian God, okay? And then he gives the result of uh, a question and answer process. They say Algeria is one who has not been made, therefore the eternal. And as I mentioned, he works on it in the present tense. Let's move forward, please. Now, okay, there's the problem. We've got one word. We've got two translations, we've got two trust networks, and we've got distrust between them. Whose side am I on? I'm telling you this story. And it's got many, many features to it, but I'll just focus on this. Whose side am I on? And why should you believe me? Like, who are you going to trust? Do you trust the anthropologist or you, do you trust the missionary? Hey, I'm born in this country. I'm brought up, actually, my father's family is from a Lutheran part of South Australia. Okay, I have a religious schooling, I'm middle class Australia. I do read and enjoy German. Um, I came across this when I was working on a recently, well, it's just coming out this month, a book on translation studies in Australia and New Zealand. I have a chapter there. And I, in that chapter, I go back and I try to show the role of translators and of extreme multilingualism in Australian history. And that's how I came on Strello's account of Algira. Okay, so I have an interest in Strello. And the other guy, Spencer, 
he's English, he's Oxford trained, he's arrogant, he insults Strello, he doesn't come out with a published critique of Strello, he works by writing little letters to everybody or all over the place. So whose side am I on? Oh, you guessed it, I'm for the missionary. And uh, other people are for the missionary as well. There is a missionary team in this debate which extends through history because uh, Strello's son, Theodore, wrote in his defense, has wrote remarkably uh, over, the, over the many years uh, in his defense. He was brought up in Arenta and German, okay? So he was brought up bilingual, um, which is an interesting position for an anthropologist and his grandson, as you will see very soon. Okay, so I'm very definitely on one side. Let's move forward, please. But let me show you some of the evidence now, as, as I do this research. This is the letter I talked about where Spencer goes off his little nut writing to Fraser, complaining about, um, about you know, this, this idea that Algeria is God. And this is the citation in German, which he has there, which, which is, you know, Fraser responds, you know, everybody cites German in, in German. Now, it's hard to read that. So when I go through the archives in the museum here, or actually it's online, let, next slide, please. Can we move to the next? I find a typewritten English translation of the same letter. <gasps> Wonderful. Oh, let's look at this. And of course, from the letter, it, it, it extracts just the little bits that Spencer was interested in having known. And Spencer has had this typed up and put in his archives. Who for? Well, for me, to make it easy for me to find the evidence that Spencer wants me to find. Uh, I say this somewhere in, in the, my book on translation history. Information doesn't just sit there. Information has been put there or maintained there in the interest of somebody getting you to see that information. Now, we don't just find it like, like you know, leaves lying on the ground or something like that. People have put it there and you've got to ask why. And Spencer put it there so I would not believe Strello. Next one, please. So that's suspicious in itself, okay? And he does the same thing for a, a letter from Kemper, who's one of the previous missionaries who had decided to use Algira as the name for the Christian God. And uh, Kemper says in this lovely typewritten translated excerpt, we know it wasn't good, we didn't, it was a bad fit, but we had no alternative uh, but to use this. Okay, and the Lutherans uh, at that stage did tend to uh, use the uh, the uh, the First Nations terms, uh, Presbyterians, however, had the opposite strategy. They would use the English terms um, and impose that on the other languages. Next slide, please. Good. Now this is where it gets really interesting. Uh, this came out uh, last month in the Australian by Strelo's grandson, John Strelo going back through this evidence and announcing that Walter Spencer not only typed up these letters so that the historian would find it, but also forged letters. Let's move forward and look at the forgery, please. So this is uh, a letter from Kemper. That was the previous uh, missionary who had made the decision effectively to use Algina as God. And uh, Strelo's son, grandson, John Strelo, compares the handwriting. Next slide, please. And if you look at the handwriting here, you can see they're talking about Algira. Just compare the A's and you will see that it's similar handwriting, but a graphologist would tell you it's not the same handwriting. So the accusation is being made as I speak that the professor at the University of Melbourne not only translated and typed up evidence, but also perhaps, perhaps forged letters to, uh, to build up his position. Let's move forward, please. Now, as I work on this though, 
uh, several things have happened. First, going through uh, Spencer and Gillen, which which is you know thousands of words and, and numerous photos, um, I, I'm beginning to see that they were very serious uh, scholars. They had an, what seems to me an erroneous preconception about what they were studying, and they always try to insist on the primitive nature and and get this quickly because it's going to disappear these people are dying out but their accounts are invaluable and i look at strelo and i do see for example in the letter that is cited and in the publication one in 1903 one in 1907 he changes his account he he, he, he makes a strong account of a high god in the letter does not make that same account in the published version. He uh, was taking Arenta cultural objects and sending them to von Leonhardi in Frankfurt and von Leonhardi was selling those to museums all over Europe. And with the money from that, Strelo built his family a house in Germany, uh, fixed up the mission church as well, uh, and paid for trips for his family. Most of his family did actually go back to German. He died um, in uh, in Central, it's not not far from uh, uh, from his mission station there, actually in Australia. Uh, Strelo permanently altered the languages he was describing, so uh, which is in inevitable, I think, because of the missionary position. So uh, the current word for Algier, Algier in, in Western Arenta now does mean the Christian God, and the word for the guy in the sky has been taken from Loricha, from the neighboring language. Uh, so there's a not a neutral description at all. It's a very incursive description. And it's suspicious that his greatest defenders are his, uh, his family and by Germanists. Uh, Outside of that network, uh, many people um, do pay homage to the quite wonderful work done by Spencer and Gillen. So my trust in Strelo has been going down and my admiration for Spencer, paradoxically, has been going up. He was hurt. He tried to defend his reputation on the European stage, but at the same time, he did some serious work. Can we move forward, please? So where am I now? Among the papers and the debates, there are people who say, look, you're arguing about nothing here. And it's true that in Spencer's earlier work, 1896, you do find an account of exactly the same high God that, exactly, almost the same high God with the emu feet and all that uh, Strelo describes with a different name. But that's not surprising because you're in different parts of central Australia. So one could uh, reconstruct, put the two together, triangulation, as we say. Uh, we could use that in order to arrive at something that might be near a kind of truth in the object. And that's what uh, von Leonardi says in his critique. He says, look, you know, you can use one who has the language and the other who doesn't have the language but has the ceremonies. And put, and put them together. He doesn't use triangulation, but he uses a comparative method and says, why not? But then he gives all the reasons why we should not trust Spencer. Let's move forward, please. A different position can be found in the literature. I have to finish quickly here. Uh, and it's found, this is Malinowski, uh, working, citing 1913. And he says that the problem with this debate is that people think it's one or the other. And he phrases it negatively, uh, it's very negatively. The Aborigines are not able to think exactly and their beliefs do not possess any exact meaning. It's very negative as, as deficit, uh, but it, it could also mean that there's tremendous variation and localization of language and beliefs. But uh, this is how Malinowski does attempt to maintain an open mind on what he is discovering. Next, please. You can look at that in positive terms, the same thing in positive terms. And this is where we get to hardcore methodology. 
take just an example of Derrida reading Kant, and, and it's one of these painfully um, exacting analyses of the passages. We have the one word that could be translated in three different ways. And, and Derrida says, well, you know, do we know which one is correct? And accepts that we will never know which one is correct. You could find this in Quine as well on the Gavagai example, on the first contact with the unknown culture, uh, that we will never reduce the indeterminacy of translation. And so we have Derrida's, uh, in this commentary on Kant, uh, l'équivoque demeure, uh, equivocation. It doesn't mean equivocación in Spanish. It means equivocation is, is, is not resolving the problem, is maintaining all the possibilities in the air. Uh, il n'est pas exclu que les deux occurrences. It's not excluded that the two renditions had more or less the same meaning for Kant. That one can use this uh, methodology of equivocation to maintain doubt without reducing it to one reading or the other. Next slide, please. This term, equivoque, uh, uh, Equivocation is picked up um, by uh, some anthropologists working in Brazil, and we have this quite well known paper on uh, perspectival anthropology, controlled equivocation, um, inspired uh, by, by Derrida. And this is of interest to me because it sort of describes where I am at the moment. I am forced to accept that both sides of this debate have good and bad points. Both can be trusted to some degree, but only to a degree. And that my work here as a mediator is to recognize equivocation and to transfer that to you, if you trust me. Next slide, please. Why is this important? The real importance is that in Australia in the past 20 years or more, if you can see the dates there, we've been going through a process of native title. And in this process by which communities have to prove their long-standing attachment to land or country, as one says, they have to show records. And oral culture does not have records that have dates. So uh, the use of strelo, is uh, touted by Anna Kenny, who has been an anthropologist, giving submissions to these hearings in order to get native title around the lands in the center of Australia there uh, for the Arenta. It's not said by Anna Kenny, who is in Strelo's camp, that the work of Spencer and Gillen is also cited in these um, submissions in order to gain native title. Uh, if you're looking at the map, you'll just see that the laws are very different in each state. So in Western Australia, uh, <laughs> has considered a, a lot of desert in the center, which is not the case in Northern Territory. And the, the place around Alice Springs is actually in the Northern Territory there. Uh, so why is this important? It's important, I think, not just to lament the European invasion, it's necessary to lament it, but not to stop at that and not to just say, well, both of these were equally bad because they changed the object of study. Let's be more practical in the real world, guard the equivocation that is there, respect it, convey it, but also have some thanks uh, for the work of these people who invested their labors in knowledge of another culture and that, very belatedly, have been able to restore some attachment to land, to that culture. I thank you very much.